Welcome to the second lecture of the 10 Ideas in 50 Years uh, lecture series. I'm Jeff Cliff, and uh, in between glares of sunlight here in Ohm Base in Thunder Bay, Ontario, um, I'm trying to get across 10 ideas that I think are important uh, and that you should know. Uh, and to reiterate, uh, the goal of this uh, video is not necessarily to give a, uh, an entire uh, deep understanding of game theory and its foundations, or to really probe into the mathematics behind the ideas that uh, are, are being talked about here, but rather to, to give you the, enough of an understanding of the idea that you could kind of see it in, in practice, that you can you know, talk intelligently or, or think intelligently about it, e even if you don't have the full depth of the idea to your credit. Um, everyone understands or has heard of E equals MC squared. Everyone, you know, has some idea of what it means, even if they don't fully understand all of its implications. But these ideas, although they are so important in the development of ideas in the past 50 years, we don't know them, we don't, we haven't heard of them, we haven't heard of the people behind them, uh, and so on and so forth. So I, I'm just trying to give an overview uh, of these ideas so that you too can go back and you know, dig up the ideas that are interesting to you, get that full understanding, and um, kind of go from there. And so the, the second idea, or the, the second paper that I'm, I'm going to try to drill down uh, for you today uh, is Mixed Indicator Strategies in Infinite Games, again by Robert Allman, uh, who is sort of becoming a, a frequent uh, person involved in these ideas, and, and I just want to get go a little bit into the, the backstory here, because we didn't go into it in the, in the first video, in that in 50 years ago, uh, much like today, we were uh, in the depth of the Cold War, and the United States and Russia, uh, the Soviet Union, were locked uh, in a, an increasingly uh, dangerous predicament where both countries had pointed increasing amounts of nuclear weapons at each other, and it wasn't clear um, if, if either of them were going to start firing, or when, or under what situations, and there was a lot of suspicion on both sides, a lot of it justified, a lot of um, you know, violence happening, and it was unclear if the entire world uh, was going to end uh, because of it. And so a lot of thinking was being done uh, both on both sides of the, the, the wall, as it were, as far to, to determine uh, how to best react to that situation and how to, to live in a situation where everything was at stake and how to best uh, act and how to best think in, in situations where a great deal, possibly everything, is at stake. And a lot of game theory came out of that. And in particular in Israel, uh, again, another place where war was a direct possibility. This was before the 67 war. And so there, there was a lot of thought going into what could cause the conflict, uh, how could different agents within a conflict or within a potential conflict uh, interact with each other and, or, or expect each other to interact, and, and how could you kind of model that? And game, a lot of game theory kind of came from that, or a lot of the research kind of came from that. And in particular, there was a conference that happened in the early 60s in Israel, uh, where a lot of the or practically everyone involved in game theory at the time, at a serious enough level, was involved, and kind of came up with a couple of theorems and ideas that uh, some of these are going to be followed from, in the, in the word. Uh, so, what, why, why are we interested? Why, why are we interested in games? And so, up until the 60s, uh, there was an understanding of game theory, and there, there was a lot of uh, modeling uh, that was being done. Um, but the, the modeling up until that point had been mostly concerned with games that were of a f finite length. So, like, you, you look at maybe even something like Risk. Generally, you, you, can, you, you can model a game like that where, or, or, or even chess, where for most of the game you can you, you can start with a certain move and then run down the consequences of that move and then run down the consequences of other moves. And in principle, there should be only a finite number of moves. And so 
those sorts of games, or, or simple games like tic-tac-toe, or uh, rock, paper, scissors, where there's you know one move or a small amount of moves, and you can drill down and make a strategy that is an optimal strategy for that game. You know, you look at war games, that, 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 that sort of approach where you know, they're, they're really trying to understand the best way to interact with a game like that. And so one of the things that we want to know about like this is specifically about games that don't necessarily end, that go on forever and s kind of continually offer us the chance to either improve our position, s stay in the same position, or, you know, lose everything or, or lose a great deal. Um, so in particular, Infinite Game. And another thing that had yet to really be thought through in using the tools of the day was games where the players don't necessarily have the big picture or have all the information, uh, at, at least at the, to start with. So, you know, if, if I'm playing poker with you, I know what my hand is, but I don't necessarily know what your hand is. And so there's going to be a whole range of different kinds of games, uh, both in, in, that you may or probably are familiar with games which you are not, uh, where the players have information that their opponents don't and vice versa. So, and how, how to best react and how to best strategize, given you only know what you know, your opponent only knows what your opponent knows, and so on and so forth. And so, So up until that, the, the most common way of looking at games was to make a tree of possibilities. So if you had two moves, M1 and M2, you would define a tree where one path you go to M1, one path you go to M2, and then you rank the alternatives uh, depending on whatever criteria of gain and loss you choose. Min-max uh, strategy came out of this. Uh, and in, in general, it is a deterministic, hopefully finite way of looking at things that gets into trouble when you don't necessarily have all the information and when the game is infinite, so the, the tree depth is also infinite. The new model that had uh, either come out shortly before this paper or uh, as a re result of it, was to treat games in terms of what's called conditional probability. Uh, so that would be viewing things in terms of if I wear a rain jacket out, what is the probability, given that, that it will rain, and vice versa, if it rains, uh, or given that it rains, what is the probability that I will wear a rain jacket? So that, that's the, the, the basic idea, this sort of probability depending on things happening. Um, which is a well-defined thing in probability theory, uh, and up until this point, uh, was not necessarily the way that things uh, were kind of modeled. And so, We're just going to lay out an example to hopefully provide some illumination here.
So the example game given to us in the paper is we have a player one chooses a uh, random real number, x1. Player two knows the first choice, so it knows x1, so it chooses a random number, one. one. Player one knows the second choice, maybe y1, but does not know his choice, x1. Chooses x2, the real number. Uh, player two knows the second choice of the first player, and his own first choice, y1, and x2, but not the first choice of the first player, so he's forgotten the first player's choice already, and then uh, chooses based on that a real number x2. Uh, so that's a little bit confusing in your head, and I'm not going to kind of bore you with the, the details of trying to explain uh, why this particular example is, is chosen, but the point of this example is that both players have a defined strategy, or, or specifically what's called a pure strategy, i.e. it is a strategy where all the information is taken into account and they can do no better given this game than that particular strategy, and it is a uh, strat strategy of finite complexity, um, and in particular, uh, the first player has one, it, it is a set of two numbers, A and F, where A is a real number, and F depends on the one one. And uh, the second player has also a pure strategy, uh, GH, that depends, or G depends on X1, and uh, H depends on uh, Y1 and X2. So, the, the point of, uh, of this particular example is that given this setup, given this particular type of game, and many other games like it, uh, there is no point between the two uh, where the, the strategies, uh, I guess, meet and produce uh, an equilibrium point, or what they call a saddle point, uh, where the, stra the strategies intersect, and given the knowledge of the other player's strategy, the, that strategy is then stable. Uh, and you th this strategy may make sense for the game, but if you know that the other player has the opposite, strategy or can come up with the alternative strategy, that strategy can change. And so, because there's no equilibrium point where the two strategies combine nicely, uh, what's called a mixed strategy is, is needed. So, uh, kind of a, another step has to be introduced to, to make these strategies optimal, given the existence of other players with an opposing strategy of this kind. And again, kind of thinking back on that game, it, it's not necessarily that the strategy is at fault, but that the game is set up in such a way that the strategy fails, or at least that the strategy can encounter a moment with a strategy that would cause that strategy to fail. And so you're going to, if, if you're defending your country from a you know, possible attacker, you're going to want to do better than that. Um, you, you want to make sure you're perhaps not not in that, that situation where your strategy is going to fail. And so what we're going to do is we're going to model our class of moves is this M, and our class of responses is R. And so if generally what we're going to see is we're going to see moves and then responses to those moves. If all of these are pure, then the, the pure strategies will probably work. Um, if uh, the or rather, if, if both of these are, are finite uh, in nature, you're probably going to, unless you have kind of a convoluted game like the one we just described, uh, pure strategies are going to be fine. Uh, if either one of these is not finite, uh, you run into problems. And specifically, you're, you're going
going to be running into problems where your one, one or the other is it's going to be insufficient. And so there's two ways of, of approaching uh, the, the, I guess, need for these strategies. The first is to uh, split apart, say, our response strategies into an infinite uh, set of finite strategies or, alternatively, to split them apart into a finite set of infinite strategies. Uh, in at least one of these cases, the, the game theory of the day kind of broke down because you couldn't actually uh, model this uh, or, in, in a sensible way. I think it's the, the, the second, the, the infinite strategy, or rather the finite set of infinite games that are possible. The finite set of infinite strategies, that idea of infinite strategy had not really been well before. So up until that point, the idea was to have a I guess measure on a set of strategies well, I, 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 where the strategies themselves were pure strategies or they finite a finite complexity. However, if the set of moves and responses is infinite, then the of course problem is that this is going to pretty much well, almost guarantee that the run into uh, strategies of infinite length in terms of the, the, the game that the strategy is for, and so that they become not well defined strategies. Another place where we, we will run into problems uh, with this kind of infinite strategy, infinite game length, is something called Kuhn's theorem. Towards the, the problem that he wants to address here, which is that 
there, there are these two different ways of looking at what a strategy is and how to use them. Uh, one where you have one strategy that is good enough, but is very complicated, and another where you have a, a lot of simple strategies to deal with your opponent. I just want to see if this is still recording, which it is. Um, and so, how are we going to deal with this? Now, before I get to that point, although it was mentioned in a previous video, I'm not sure if that video made it all the way here. So, we're going to define what's called a plural set. So a plural set is, is just a, a kind of set, uh, much like other sets. Uh, it is a set in topological space, so it's a s kind of uh, space set, as it were, um, that can be formed by the following three things. Uh, union of elements, relative complement of elements, and a countably or a Countable amount, not an uncountable, it's an countable amount of intersection of those elements. And so if you have those three things, you have a bullet set. So the way that mixed strategies up until this paper had been defined had been purely in terms of this, I guess, distribution of strategies. And it wasn't until this point where a new approach to defining a mixed strategy was found, which is to not necessarily pick the distribution, but to pick a function that chooses that distribution for you. And so it, it kind of separates a little bit. Uh, it, it provides a layer of indirection so that maybe some of these infinites and some of these problems with dealing with defining strategies of infinite complexity uh, can be addressed a little bit better. So, we're going to kind of view this from the perspective of the defender of a someone who's playing player two, the person who's worried that their opponent is going to send nuclear tipped missiles at us. And so this player two is going to pick a function. So the moves is, are going to be followed by responses. And so the the chance that or the, the combination of chance and player one's action. So maybe what player one had for breakfast today is going to determine their actions a little bit. Um, but some combination of these things is going to choose M for us. We're, we don't have to really worry too much about choosing M, because M is the for us. Uh, the question is, does F, this, this function that we pick, kind of induce any properties of R? Does, does this function give us anything? Turns out it can. If we want to find x where f of x is part of some borel set, some set B, um, then the probability of that is equal to the probability of the inverse of that function over that, that region B. 
And this works if the inverse function is defined. And an additional restriction on this is that this function has to be what's called an n-transformation. And we talked about n-transformations a little bit in our last video. I'm not going to necessarily go over the details, but it's a certain kind of, I guess, transforming function that you could kind of define. But this isn't very general, so we're running into this problem where we could, you know, cherry pick our function so that it would give us this you know, probability that we're in this part of you know, our resulting set. Uh, but this should sound very familiar for anyone who's seen the last video, because it is exactly the situation of picking a function at random. And we know that you don't necessarily want to have uh, kind of restrictions on there. And perhaps we could easily or view it in a different way in that we want to view in terms of the set of m or n transformations from R to N. So the transformations from our I guess response moves to the moves. So we want to find these inverse functions in, in this large set. But unfortunately this set is way too large uh, to define uh, I guess functions that will lead to uh, this in a predi predictable way that will allow us to define I guess functions that will reach the entire set. So kind of going back, we, we want to define a function that will choose us a strategy, but we want this function to be general enough, or we want the strategies that it can reach to be general enough, that we don't necessarily have to you know, cherry pick which strategies because we may be restricted in terms of what strategies we can use. We definitely don't want that if the good ones are out of reach. And so uh, this, this set, uh, potential functions is, or, or these potential ranges for those functions is too large. But again, thanks to the previous video, we have a way of getting around that. And the way around that is going to look like this. We're going to have this set, and this, this will hopefully be a little bit of a review from the last video, perhaps simplified a little bit. But we have a set that is basically a random chance set, a, a set uh, between 0 and 1 where a random variable a random event happens, or a random variable is defined for us. We have a function that goes from this random variable to this large set. Uh, this is not an M transformation, so we have no problem defining it. It's just this very general function that we don't necessarily even have to care too much about the outcome. Then we have the Cartesian product of a chance set, again, the very same kind of chance set we have up here, and our R moves, the moves we want to make. And a function defined from that set to our I guess responses, the responses that our player to is going to want to make in response to that. So kind of looking at that, we have the moves that we want to react to, the Cartesian product of that and chance. Uh, there's going to be a correspondence between these two uh, kinds or these two functions such that what we really want is this one over here. And because it's isomorphic to this one up here, we can actually find in practice, I like the, the developments to our game is we're going to be able to define a function where a w, a randomly chosen value, or a randomly chosen subset of a random set. Um, 
function of w of x is going to give us a function of w as a function of x. Um, I flip a coin and if it lands, say it heads, we have our first function. If it lands tails, we get our second function. Or alternatively, we spin a roulette wheel uh, depending what number we get, even if there's an infinite number of positions on this roulette-like barrel roulette wheel, um, we'll still get a random value from that if we choose to define a function. Uh, because in the last uh, video, uh, we kind of went through that this is a kosher thing to do, uh, or a way to define um, functions at random, now we have a method of the finding uh, a potentially infinite number uh, of functions um, so that even if the, 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 the strategies or the functions we point to uh, are finite in length, we can still deal with this situation of a game uh, where the, the, the length of the game is infinite, the, the complexity of the game is infinite, and so on. Is a kind of coping mechanism that gets gets us one step further than we were before. Um, and we're going to go a little bit more into detail of how. But again, just to reiterate, what this gives us is that we don't necessarily have to defend or de depend on a direct relationship between our, I guess, moves and responses, and the, the, the entire, I guess, combination of them for infinite games, because there may be infinite moves and infinite responses, and defining, I guess, those uh, is, is, is not allowable. Uh, however, because these are a relatively small sets, they constrain the moves to kind of a smaller mathematical space. Um, and you know, their probability spaces, they have these, these kind of special properties, uh, or, or rather they're, they're related to probability in that they're random number spaces. Uh, so it is a constraining force on them. But again, this, this, this is kind of, we're, we're back to where we were in the last video. We're, 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 we're down in the math, we're, you know, we've got this idea, great, we can, we can deal with infinite games now, but how exactly do we do that? You know, do, we, do we just draw a picture and does it just magically happen? No. What it means is that the very definition of games has changed. Games up until that point were, they, they, they would come into these situations where a, a player would have a, a, a lack of information and it wasn't exactly clear how to deal with that information. You can model a strategy that would you know, deal with it in a finite way that would still fail when you got to the infinite piece. And so now, the very, you know, the very basic level
four player one. Or rather, for any particular thing. From their viewpoint. So this is defining the game purely in terms of the viewpoints of each player. So this is the end. So the sequence of moves, M, in a greater set, M of I, of actions M. So the, the, the game is defined as a sequence of moves of possible moves that can be made against this player L. A sequence of responses, a action R that this player can take. A set of Z, and this is going to be a really big set, but it's, it's going to be a set uh, of opponent strategies. So this is going to be, you're basically defining each player as this, including the set of strategies that their opponents can have. The sequence of functions, uh, which are the cross product of Z, i.e. their opponent strategies, and the moves, response moves. So basically, you're, you're going to have a strategy, and it's going to generate predict predictions of moves, or predictions of responses, depending where in the game you turn up. And, and this is going to determine which function, hey, where in the game you are, is going to determine what function you end up getting. A payoff space, H, so kind of a, a ranking of potential spaces uh, to allow you to or to allow this player L uh, to choose between spaces in an optimal fashion. And then the, uh, I, I guess, a payoff function, which then takes from the set of strategies and the set of responses, and uh, I guess based on that, chooses some place in the space, presumably where this player wants to go. Now, that's this is the first, and th this is kind of where we're kind of building towards in this, this video here, is that we, we, we've come up with this way of approaching games in that you actually have to treat each player as kind of a unique a unique opponent with a unique history, with a unique set of opponent strategies that that player can conceive, and so on. And then, what you get from this... Because this probability space, or mega, is used by each player, because each player is playing rationally, they kind of collapse on each other. So you can actually define the, the A space to be the Cartesian product of all these probabilities, or, or I guess random number spaces. But again, this is still a random number. It's got a little bit of structure on it, but it's still a, a choice from a choice from a choice from a choice from a choice. It is a, a, a random number that has been picked because another random number was picked because another random number was picked because another random number was picked. And so you, you get into this situation where this is still a random number. It is definably random. It has got all the nice properties of random numbers that we can use. And so this will allow us to kind of simplify the strategies down a little bit. And it allows us to define a strategy. Which we're not even going to write down because there's kind of no point. Uh, but, but it allows us, so, so the, the proof and the strategy are a little bit complicated, but it, it's not even important which strategy they kind of come up with. 
the, the important part is they come up with it because of this model of players. If you first normalize this random number for each player, like let's say your player two, you want to not necessarily view this random number and view Kind of going back to our original diagram, we have this random number mixed with this cross product of that and the opponent's name. So if you're player two, you want player one and their random number to kind of be mixed with or to have this Cartesian product of that and your random number. But again, that turns into a random number. It, it basically simplifies down to two, two, two uh, components again. And so even if you have 100 players or, or even potentially infinite number of players, you're still going to get this simplification down to a random number and a move. And so if you have that, you can still define this function. You can define this strategy. And uh, it, as in the last video, you can define it. Uh, you end up with, you need basically three components to do it. I'm not necessarily going to review that, but again, it, because we, we've simplified the, the possible moves that can be made down to this, uh, kind of gets us to the next step, which is that we then ran, or randomly choose strategy based on that. And so our strategy B is going to be a, a random choice multiplied by our opponent's move is going to determine a random response. Now, if, if you're the player, this doesn't really help you all that much because you're basically just playing randomly. But for someone who's modeling you as a player, this actually does help because this will allow us to kind of close the loop and to model games of infinite length and of infinite character so that they become kind of tractable. Um, and so specifically, the payoff function is going to depend on this, not this, this function. So in, in the past, what they were doing is they were trying to go, uh, maybe not from this function, but from something very much like it were, that wound up in this set of all possible move and responses. But this set is too large to have a function point two, uh, and so any payoff function that you could define on it is going to be insufficient. Uh, but this strategy can define a payoff function. And so if you choose a function of random and it has a particular payoff, you may accept or not accept that payoff. You may then accept another strategy with a different payoff, maybe higher or lower. Uh, again, so if you, you know, choose a large amount of random strategies from this pool in this manner, uh, then you can choose the best one as your action. And so even in the case where there's an infinite amount of choice available to you, your only constrain perhaps in your ability to look into that infinite, not by the model's ability to generate responses to it. So ho hopefully th this gives a little bit of a clear picture for why this, this particular way of generating functions was important at all. Um, it was a little bit difficult to get that across in the last video because 
although it you know, may seem like it may have worked, uh, it wasn't clear whether there was any value to it. But now we kind of have some value from it in that we can, we can pull strategies in a definable way, in a way that is meaningful based on the moves that were defined for us, like moves of our, of our opponent, and random chains. And so that is kind of a, 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 an early way of looking at these, these mixed strategies, or these strategies that, and again, th this, this is going to be a, this strategy is going to be a strategy. Right? I guess a set in our responses. So the responses themselves, even if they're picked kind of randomly, they can be meaningful. Uh, you you can respond to a, a missile being fired at you with another missile, uh, or you can respond with the consideration of you know further diplomatic responses, etc. But the the choice, the, the fact that the model is able to generate this this strategy with the particular payoff function, um, it is at least going to get us that far. So we're not completely helpless, even in the games which are infinite in length. And that is our second idea. This is 10 ideas in 50 years, uh, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to make comment of, of them to me. Uh, I will try to you know, clear anything that I got, you know, didn't quite get across or, or perhaps with, even was mistaken about, um, and uh, hopefully you enjoyed it.